Kathleen. I work for the Alice Paul Institute. Uh, people that are new to us, the Alice Paul Institute um, honors the legacy of Alice Paul through programming, uh, and we are based out of her historic home in southern New Jersey, where we would normally run uh, in-person programming, but alas, we are now virtual, which means a lot of great things, we think. Silver linings is that we can reach so many more people and make this accessible outside of our on-site um, capacities. And for today's programming, we were lucky enough to have Lisa Hendrickson. She is um, a board member, but she has also been working as an independent historian on a lot of different projects throughout the state of New Jersey. Um, going to a lot of different places <laughs> to learn about uh, local people in the movement, things of that nature. Um, so some questions you can expect to hear answers to today are, uh, who were some of the early male suffrage supporters in New Jersey before 1890? Who were some of the active male supporters in New Jersey after 1890? What suffrage organizations did these men belong to? What were some of the reasons they advocated for votes for women? And why did women want and need the support of men for their cause? So those are some key points uh, Lisa will be hitting today with her uh, talk and presentation. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll kind of work to answer them as best as possible. Um, and from there, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa so she can tell you more about what she's learned. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Colleen, and uh, welcome to everybody who's joining us. Thank you for taking the time today to um, hear some interesting information on uh, the suffrage movement, hopefully interesting information to you. Um, so today um, you're going to meet some of the New Jersey men who actively supported the suffrage movement and learn why it was important that women engaged men in their efforts to gain the right to vote. Although New Jersey, the New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association was one of the first state organizations founded in the country in 1867, the movement grew slowly with only a small number of organized suffrage groups across New Jersey until the early 1900s. Initially, suffrage groups were predominantly made up of women and men who supported the movement joined the women's groups. According to Brooke Kroger in her article, The Little Known Story of Men Who Fought for Women's Votes, she said, from the beginning of their involvement, these men willingly acted on orders from and in tandem with the women who ran the greater state and national suffrage campaigns. This bucked the societal norms of the day where men held all public power legally and politically. Male allies were vital to the success of the women's suffrage movement. As members of privileged group, men had the advantage of being influential and respected in most areas, especially at the polls and the, in government, writes Laurieann Lebrun, author of the article, Suffragist Men and the Importance of Allies. Many of the men who advocated for the movement were political and business kingmakers who also supported societal causes such as civil rights, child welfare, and prison reform. In addition to these powerful advocates, a wide range of men from rural areas, urban areas, immigrant groups, and religious groups also gave support. Also gave support. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. So I have pictures of some of the early supporters that were active before 1890. So early participants in the suffrage movement included men like Frederick Douglass, Henry Blackwell, Thomas Petty, John Gage, and John Whitehead, who worked alongside their wives, mothers, sisters, and friends advocating for women's suffrage. Many of these families were also highly involved in the abolition movement. Frederick Douglass was best known as an abolitionist, but also actively supported women's suffrage. At the first women's rights convention held in 1848 in Seneca Falls, he was the only African-American in attendance. A 
According to historian Lisa Tetralt, in her book, The Myth of Seneca Falls, were it not for Douglas's oratory demanding the vote for women, the ninth resolution of the Declaration of Sentiments might have failed. In addition, an artic in an article written for The Crisis by Mary Church, Church Terrell, she says it was largely due to Douglas's masterful eloquence that the motion was carried in spite of the opposition of its very distinguished and powerful foes. In Douglas's autobiography, he says, observing women's agency, devotion, and efficiency caused me, or sorry, um, gave me gratitude for this high service, early moved me to favorable attention to the subject of what is called women's rights and caused me to be a denominated women's rights man. I have been convinced of the wisdom of women's suffrage and I've never denied the faith. Next, we have Henry Blackwell. Um, Henry Blackwell was the husband of Lucy Stone and was an important suffrage leader in the 19th century. Born in 1825 in Bristol, England, his family immigrated to New York City in 1832. Blackwell and his brothers worked in the hardware business and were active in social reform, especially anti-slavery issues. After his marriage to Stone, he worked for a book publishing firm and the couple moved to Orange, New Jersey. Along with his wife, Blackwell was very involved in the women's suffrage movement and attended the founding convention of the New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association in Vineland in 1867, serving on the executive committee for several years. He helped Stone found the American Women's Suffrage Association in 1869 and the Women's Journal, which he edited for many years. Thomas Petty is somebody um, you probably haven't heard of before. He was born in Scotland and immigrated to Newark in 1833 becoming a successful manufacturer of traveling bags and trunks. He was elected to the New Jersey Assembly, then served as mayor of Newark, and later was elected to Congress. Petty supported the Newark community financially with donations, including funds for the Petty Memorial Church, which is right off of uh, Military Park, which became the site for many important women's suffrage events. He attended the annual New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association Convention and was elected a vice president, then later served as vice president of the Essex County Women's Suffrage Association. John Gage was the husband of suffragist Portia Gage and the brother-in-law of well-known writer and suffragist Frances Dana Gage. Born in Herkimer County, New York in 1802, he was an iron worker by trade. Gage married Portia in 1830, and the couple had 13 children, moving from New York to Illinois to Vineland, New Jersey in 1864. He opened the first canning factory in Vineland and was active in local politics. His suffrage activity included attending the founding convention of the New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association in 1867, where he was elected a vice president. John Whitehead was born in 1819 and was raised in Newark, New Jersey. A lawyer by trade, he was also a civic advocate, activist advocating for improved public education and the abolition of slavery. An early supporter of women's suffrage, Whitehead was elected a vice president of the New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association in 1868. In addition, he wrote articles for the Women's Journal on the legal status of women based on New Jersey law. Continuing his involvement in the movement, he served as president of the New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association and also president of the American Women's Suffrage Association. As the movement gained momentum around 1910, men became, began forming their own suffrage groups, including the New Jersey Men's League for Women's Suffrage organized in 1910, and the Men's League for Equal Suffrage with branches in many cities, including Trenton, Montclair, and Passaic. According to Brooke Kroger, 
the founders of the Men's League knew that to help sway the course of history, they needed a full-fledged national organization with all the effort and expense that implied. She also wrote, as the movement grew in strength and acceptance, its important new champions attracted beneficial press, whether they gave speeches, appeared in marches or social gatherings, worked the halls of influence in Washington, published buzzworthy as essays and attention-grabbing diatribes in the forms of letters to the editor. I'll go to my next slide. Um, here are some of the men that were supporters after 1890. So men's groups grew in membership, perhaps because they organized male-oriented events. While women held teas to discuss suffrage, the men's groups held smokers, offering attendees an unlimited supply of pipes and tobacco to come and listen to speakers and join in open discussions on suffrage. Such meetings were held at the, in Patterson at the Colt Building, which was uh, a gun manufacturer, by the New Jersey Men's League for Equal Suffrage. Male supporters also attended rallies, like the 1914 Suffrage Day in Passaic, where men held two rousing meetings in favor of woman suffrage with local politicians and prominent businessmen who addressed crowds explaining why they were in favor of suffrage. During many large women's suffrage events, men simultaneously held their own events. In Ocean Grove in 1913, Tandem meetings were held at the convention center in the auditorium by the New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association and the New Jersey Men's League for Women's Suffrage with, with the purpose of achieving a yes vote in the fall 1914 suffrage referendum. Theodore Roosevelt was one of the chief speakers at these meetings. Religious organizations were also places where men gathered to show support for suffrage. In 1915, um, one of the men's clubs of the First Methodist Episcopal Church debated and then voted to support suffrage at their fall meeting. Rabbi Leo Mannheimer of the Barnard Temple in Patterson spoke out in support of suffrage saying, it seems to me an act of justice that the franchise should be given to women. Many well-known men during this time were suffrage advocates including William Lloyd Garrison, Henry James, Mark Twain, Thomas Edison, Henrik Ibsen, H.G. Wells, Theodore Roosevelt, and Ralph Waldo Emerson. Thomas, uh, Thomas Edison first publicly endorsed suffrage in an interview printed in the Passaic Daily News in 1915 saying, women represent the better part of the family and the better part of the community. Women are more moral than men. They are more honest than men. Their political influence in the community would be good. Thanks, Thomas. Um, Theodore Roosevelt urged New Jersey men to vote yes for the suffrage referendum. In an article for the Passaic Daily News, he is quoted as saying, conservative friends tell me that woman's duty is in the home. Certainly, but so is man's. The duty of the woman to the home isn't any more than the man's. If the average man has more leisure time to think of public matters than the average woman has, then it is a frightful reflection on him. As in the early years, many of the men who championed suffrage were married to women who were leaders in the movement, including Champlain Riley, Richard Stevens, Everett Colby, Edward Feckert, and Henry Otto Whitpen. Um, here, I don't have a picture of Champlain, Lord Riley, um, that was good enough to show, but I, I showed one of the, um, his name below one of the, the buttons. So Champlain, Lord Riley, was born in 1877 in East Orange, New Jersey, and married Ida Holt in 1904. Riley was president of the American Society of Heating and Ventilation Engineers, and a partner in an engineering consulting firm. Both Ida and Champlain were active in the suffrage movement as well as at many other organizations 
in Plainfield where they resided. Champlain spoke at the 1910 New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association Convention, where he was asked to form a men's league. In his address, he said, as the women cannot now vote unless the men give them that privilege, it is strictly up to the men to do it. And there was no better way than to begin by forming clubs with the aim of helping the cause along. He founded the first chapter of the New Jersey Men's League for Women's Suffrage and served as its president for many years. During the 1915 New Jersey Next campaign, which you see on um, one of the posters in the lower left corner, Riley bought um, a little yellow car he named Voter as a publicity stunt. And I have a newspaper clipping of the little yellow car um, in it was suffragist, British suffragist, Miss Eve Ward, who drove the car across New Jersey to interact with men in all 21 counties. She visited factories at lunch hour, called on politicians, talked to men directly, in addition to handing out literature and giving speeches. Um, I could only find um, this kind of caricature cartoon of Richard Stevens. But Richard Stevens was the fourth son of Edwin H. Stevens, founder of the Stevens Institute of Technology. He was born in Paris in 1868, attended Columbia University, earning a law degree in 1892. Although he was admitted to the bar and established a law firm, he instead devoted himself to public policy and charity work along with his sister, Caroline Stevens Whitpin. Together, they worked on many social issues, including justice reform. Richard was an ardent suffrage supporter, holding many meetings at his home, the mansion called Castle Point. And he acted as a member of the Men's League for Equal Suffrage. His brother-in-law, Henry Otto Whitpen, was born in 1871 in Jersey City to German immigrant parents. He was a grocery store merchant, becoming, later becoming the youngest mayor of Jersey City in 1908. Henry continued his public service by twice running for New Jersey governor and served as the overseer of the Port of New York. He joined wife Carolyn Stevens in advocating for women's suffrage by signing support petitions and attending rallies. Everett Colby, was born in 1875 in Wisconsin and married suffragist Edith Colby in 1903, settling in Llewellyn Park, New Jersey. A lawyer by trade, he served both the New Jersey State Assembly and the New Jersey Senate. During his time in government, he came out strongly in support of women's suffrage and was a founding member of the New Jersey Men lead for women's suffrage along with Champlain Riley. So more than 100 years after New Jersey women first gained the right to vote in the 1776 New Jersey State Constitution, which is um, a right they lost in 1807, New Jersey finally ratified the 19th Amendment on February 9, 1920. With the help of men like the, the ones I profiled, the United States Constitutional event, Amendment granting women the right to vote was passed by 38 states in August of 1920. So um, I, API is going to post my full article and a general source list on their website later this week. And I thank you all for um, listening to our discussion on, on men in the movement. So I guess now I will um, try to answer any questions that uh, might have come through the chat room through Colleen. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I really <laughs> loved your presentation. Uh, I don't know who knows this, but I get to experience it um, in, t in full for the first time with all of you. And I, uh, liked the comparison of the teas versus the smokers. Um, but I don't know if anyone in attendance has any questions. Um, 
we have one from Kevin Douglas asking about, could you speak to Woodrow Wilson's role in the 1915 referendum, um, seeing as he was the former governor of New Jersey? Uh, Lisa, I don't know if you came across anything in your- um, You know, I he was initially um, not in favor of, of women's suffrage um, and through a lot of uh, the public persuasion, um, especially through um, the protesting in 1917, um, did finally come around to it. I'm really not an expert in um, Woodrow Wilson, so I, I don't have a lot of details on, on the referendum, but he definitely was not in initially in favor of women's suffrage and um, it took quite a lot of cajoling and protesting um, before he did come around and um, got behind it. Okay, um, we have a question from Angela Dotson. Were there any African-American men in New Jersey who were active in the suffrage movement? Um, I know you've spent some time trying to go to local historic societies and finding out more about uh, African-American involvement in the movement in the state in general. And I don't know what you've been able to find. Um, you know, un unfortunately there was um, not remotely as much written about prominent Af African-American men or women who were active in the suffrage movement. Um, I have done some research on some of the um, African-American suffragists. I honestly did not do a huge deep dive into um, the men who, African-American men who supported it. So, you know, there undoubtedly were um, a lot of men, but they might not have had the voice to or be reported as um, supporting it. Um, it was it was hard enough even to find information on on some of the the prominent wealthy women. But in like the um, the husbands who supported Lillian Feckert um, and Colby, the husbands of um, some of the other African American suffragists, I'm assuming also were supportive of of their wives and what they were doing because being a part of the movement um, was already um, difficult for women. And so if you really didn't have the support of your husbands or your um, brothers, it, it was really hard to be part of the movement. Okay. Um, we have a question about the Vineland Convention. Um, have, did you, do you know where that was held at in Vineland? Um, it, at the Plum Street Hall, um, which unfortunately is no longer, um, standing. Um, you, there's, I'm not sure what building, but the, um, Vineland Historical Society has quite a bit of, of memorabilia. Um, Vineland was a very important suffrage center. Um, in the New Jersey movement, and they were quite early activists. So um, they they have a little bit of information up on their website. And I guess once once everybody's historical societies are are able to open again, they you have a voting box from an early voting box that women used when they tried to vote in Vineland. Um, but it was at um, Plum Street Hall was the convention. Okay. Um, in the Ocean Grove connection, was there a religious component? Do you know? Um, y yes, the, um, and I, I won't be able to come up with his name, but there was um, a minister who was in charge of, of the tabernacle and um, had partnered with um, Manola Graham Sexton, who was the president of the New Jersey Women's Association at the time. And, um, so since many wealthy people uh, went down to the shore or had shore houses, um, they had summer meetings there for quite a few years. And every year he welcomed back um, the, the suffrage meetings. So 
and they usually open programs with um, an invocation and, and closed it um, with a prayer or something. So there were definitely um, religious ties and meeting at the tabernacle. Um, they had many suffrage meetings there too. Great. Um, I want to give a shout out to um, Susanna and Carol for uh, posting in the chat some more information about the referendum. Thank um, you. <laughs> Uh, I have been trying to get through some of the uh, more New Jersey specific questions um, just before we kind of hit time because I know we said we were going to stick to 30 minutes and we're almost at that 30 minute mark. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any questions kind of specific more to New Jersey history. Um, it definitely sounds like we might have to look into programming focusing more on um, Wilson and his role in the future. Um, so everyone's going to have to come back for that. Um, um, we have a question about saying many of these men seem financially successful. How much was economics an influence, do you think? Um, definitely the, the men that I profiled absolutely all were financially successful either in their own right or, um, as, uh, members of, of very important families. Um, you know, money, when, if you had money, then you were able to use it to help financially support the cause. You also had a certain status, stature that um, people listened to you and that you um, felt that you could speak your mind. Um, also, many of the wealthy were highly involved in politics. And so, you know, one of the best ways to influence um, laws is to be a part of, of politics. So there were um, undoubtedly as I, I said earlier in, in the program, there were men in rural areas, there were immigrant men, so, but they wouldn't necessarily have been reported on in newspaper articles and wouldn't have been quoted in articles like I, I found um, for, versus some of these more famous or wealthy kinds of patrons. So, you know, as with women, if you were working class, um, you definitely were not given the limelight necessarily. Um, a gentleman named Samuel Gompers, who was um, a very prominent labor leader in New Jersey, um, partnered with the suffrage movement um, and Daniel Lehane. So they were quoted in some newspaper articles and were part of some of the suffrage organizations and were not necessarily um, as financially successful as some of these men were. 